Yes. So, hello everybody. Hi. Uh, welcome to this round of uh, Bilge University Media Department's Domino Lectures. Today we have a very exciting uh, seminar lined up. I have two colleagues from Croatia, uh, Dr. Pashko Bilic and also Dr. Tony Prog. Uh, welcome to both of you. I hope you're well. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Hi, welcome. And we have uh, Dr. Yusuf Yuksekta from our own department. Hi, Yusuf. Uh, welcome. Uh, hi. Well. hi. Well, and hi, everyone. Yes, hello. Um, so uh, let me quickly introduce um, the lecture. I'll give the title and then I will introduce both of the speakers very briefly. And then without, without taking too much time, I will uh, turn the microphone over to our presenters and we will proceed with uh, the presentation. Okay, so today's talk is called uh, Digital Monopoly Platforms and Public Wealth from Public Innovation to Monopoly and Back Again. And here we have Back Again in question marks and in brackets. Um, and to introduce uh, our two speakers today, um, I'm just going to read uh, the bios that you shared with me. Uh, Dr. Pashko Bilic is Research Associate at the Institute for Development and International Relations in Zagreb, Croatia. Previously, he was International Visiting Research Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies, University of Westminster in London, UK as well as Doctoral Research Fellow at the University of uh, Alberta, Edmonton, Canada. He published in journals such as Internet Histories, Javnost, The Public, uh, Political Economy of Communication, Triple C, Communication, Capitalism and Critique, New Media and Society, European Journal of Co Communication, Big Data and Society, and Interaction, Studies in Communication and Culture. That's a lot of journals. Uh, he is the author uh, with Tony Prog and uh, Miswav uh, Zhitko of the Political Economy of Digital Monopolies, Contradictions and Alternatives to Data Commodification. And uh, their book will be coming out from Bristol University Press in 2021. Uh, Sociology of Media, Routines, Technology and Power. Uh, this is, I think, Yezenski i Turk. Uh, I'm probably slaughtering the pronunciation, but I'm trying my best. And this came out just last year. And the main editor with Jakab Primorac and uh, Jaki Valtisan of Technologies of Labor and the Politics of Contradiction. And this was released uh, by Palgrave Macmillan in 2018. So this was, this was Pashko. And to introduce Tony, uh, Tony Prog is an independent researcher based in Zagreb, Croatia. Uh, previously, he was teaching assistant school of business and management at Queen Mary University at the University of London, where he also obtained his PhD on non-market and egalitarian production in 2014. He is the author with Pashko Bilic and Mislav Zhitko of uh, the political economy of digital monopolies, contradictions and alternatives to data commodification, the book that I just previously mentioned. He was the lead researcher with T. Buble and uh, M. Kikash of Le Mapping Left Actors, Croatia. And this was a publication supported by the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, uh, Southeast Europe 2018. He has been presenting regularly at heterodox economic, uh, co economics conferences over a decade. He has appeared as a guest lecturer at the University of Zagreb, uh, University of Zadar, University of Rijeka, uh, Faculty of Economics, uh, Political Science, Sociology and Cultural Studies. He has 10 years of experience as a software and networks engineer in London, producing both proprietary software and releasing free and open software. So that was a, that was a long introduction. I think Tony just got cut off. Let me just uh, put him back on. Hi again, Tony. So Hi. that was just me introducing both of you. So just before yeah. we begin, I, 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 this talk is, I think, based around your upcoming book. So maybe you might just take a few minutes to tell us about your book before we proceed to the presentation. How does that sound? Fine. <laughs> so where shall we begin? Uh, I, I wish we wrote uh, shorter biographies uh, to, to start yes. with. Um, <laughs> 
we, we should have we should have written our, our affiliations but um, yeah I mean uh, about the book you mean about the formalities before I start with the presentation yes uh, like you know when is it, when is it coming out uh, Bristol University Press yeah. Bristol University Press how was the experience just uh, you know yeah well Bristol University Press is a social science publisher from the UK and they actually approached us at, at an international conference and we had really good communication with them uh, and we're really satisfied with the with the production process and everything the book is basically the result of a couple of years of discussions and debates between the three of us now it's uh, Tony uh, and myself here and and we also have a third author uh, Mislav Zhitko who's a colleague and, and and friend interested in broader issues of um, philosophy of science and Marxian economics so the three of us had meetings, discussions, debates, uh, arguments uh, about our own points of view when it comes to um, digital monopolies. And I think that the book is, is, is an outcome um, on which I think none of us can take full claim of. Uh, I think uh, all of our ideas are visible in, in the final outcome. Um, and, and I think that none of us individually could have written the book um, in, in its form that, that it has now. The book will be published um, officially, I think it's the 16th of uh, July this year. So now it's in the production process. You can, you can find it already on, on Amazon and on, on Bristol University Press uh, website. You can actually pre-order some marketing here going on. Shameless marketing. You can actually pre-order with a 20% discount the book, uh, the book right now. So Tony, I don't know if you want to say anything about the book or the process. Well, do we have a discount code also, Pasco? That you know how they sell that shit. <laughs> So I'm really looking forward to the book, by the way. Tony, would you like to add anything also about uh, about your uh, publication that's coming up, your book? No, other than that I've been quite surprised with how professional and timely Bristol Press has been in production. Uh, it's a clear process with a lot of stops and, 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 and points, and they've been really making it easy for us to just do our job and focus on the content, which is great, which is not the experience I had before. So I'm really enjoying it, like Pash. That's great to hear. Great to hear. I mean, yes, university press can be a little bit troublesome. They take a lot of time to review your stuff. And mm -hmm. so, you know, very happy to hear that. It's also good marketing, I guess, for Bristol University Press. If there's anybody they, who's they, listening. They deserve, they deserve it, really. I mean, it really helps really? us to, to, to focus on content. Cool, cool. That's really nice to hear. So once again, uh, Pashko and Tony's book is coming out in July 2021 um, with the title that I just described. Um, so yes, how about let's proceed on to uh, the presentation and sure. see and uh, get ready, yeah? So let me just uh, share the screen with you. Sure. Okay, so you should see the, the PowerPoint. So the, thank you once again for, uh, for having us. Uh, it's a pleasure to, um, to present the book that uh, will be published in a couple of months. Um, and as I said, the book is the result of uh, a few years of presentations uh, of various uh, segments and parts of the book at different conferences as well as discussions uh, between between the three of us. Um, so here's another uh, advertising slide that I prepared and I suppose it's it's good marketing to to put it at the beginning of the of the presentation even before people get to hear uh, what we will talk about. So I hope I won't or that we won't disappoint <laughs> you by the end of the uh, end of the presentation. Um, 
So uh, let me just start with, uh, with, with the natural starting point, which is to talk about um, some key concepts that, that we used uh, in the book. Um, we started off with a, with a fairly simple research question. And, and that one, uh, that research question is, given the nominally competitive character of developed economies, why is there a single company for socially and economically important functions such as web searching, which is Google, social networking such as Facebook, and online retailing such as Amazon. And it's fairly easy, uh, easy to conclude uh, or, or to see from an everyday experiential perspective that, that there are very few choices uh, out there when it comes to these um, digital services. Uh, yet when it comes to the regulatory framework and, and the social, political and economic framework, um, there are various um, obstacles, uh, so to speak, um, uh, when it comes to curbing curbing their power and, and accumulated uh, economic and, and political wealth. Uh, we focus in the book, we focus on five companies, uh, um, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon and Microsoft or GAFAM, as they are sometimes uh, labeled in, in um, financial markets. Uh, and we look at their uh, specifically at their data and surplus value extraction techniques, particularly on Google and Facebook for two reasons, because theoretically these are the two most difficult uh, business models to explain from a critical uh, Marxian perspective, uh, also even from a, from a mainstream economic perspectives as well. And we will get to that. Uh, later in the presentation. Uh, the, those two reasons are that they are offered free of charge, so you don't pay anything. Uh, ultimately, this means that they're the product or the output of, of their uh, labor and, and uh, of the means of production deployed in, in the production of these services are offered free of charge. Okay. Uh, the second one is that the main source of revenue is advertising, and this, of course, has multiple effects on, on the news media as they dominate um, internet advertising, leaving less money on the table, so to speak, for, for digital news media, which obviously results in a, in a multitude of negative consequences, such as disinformation, uh, poor quality of journalistic work, and so on. Um, so the first question, and obviously these are uh, capitalist companies, and you can see um, a, a lot of a uh, lot of um, data, a lot of publications in um, economics uh, journals, uh, weeklies, and even daily press about their e economic power. And in, in academic academic uh, studies, there have been a number of analyses that try to look at the specificities of digital companies. And there have been a number of uh, proposed terms to describe the role of uh, big tech in, in contemporary capitalism, such as digital capitalism. Probably the most popular one would be the cognitive capitalism perspective, also platform capitalism, surveillance capitalism, and obviously, since we are talking about monopolies, monopoly capitalism, which is not extended to big tech. Um, uh, to that extent, that, that, is, that interests us, but it is a perspective that we took into account when we were discussing different different um, ways in which we can describe their role in contemporary capitalism. Now, we ended up uh, we ended up um, taking a fairly conservative approach, because, simply because if you look at all of these uh, terms, and when it comes to digital technologies, there's often an inflation of terms that try to, to describe the latest uh, technological developments and, and latest uh, gadgets, products and services. Ultimately, the mode of production in which these um, services are being produced is, is basically the same as the one that was described by Marx. So you have the main elements such as money, capital, means of production, labor power that produces commodities and results in surplus value and accumulation of capital. So the main mechanisms are still there, such as exploitation of labor and also extraction of surplus value. What is new in this context is data as raw material for commodification, something obviously that was not a not a, an important systemic element in, in 19th century capitalism. The second one is the legal form that is necessary for the reproduction of capital. And, and we, will, we will 
explain this a little bit in the presentation, but um, we explained it in, in quite some detail in, in the book, both in theoretical and empirical terms, because you need uh, legal forms such as uh, antitrust regulation, you need uh, intellectual property rights uh, to be able to commodify data from uh, using different services. Also, what is it? What is novel is that um, a specific technological form, such as these services, we call it a technological form in the book, but we don't have much time to, to go into detail um, when it comes to that specific aspect. Uh, so a specific technology that is used at the same time as means of production for Google and Facebook, and that is also used in, in everyday life to, to communicate, to search for information and to perform various uh, various tasks online. So these are three novelties of the mode of production, so to speak, um, that, that we address in, in the book. Um, the, the term that perhaps gathered uh, or still gathers at least within critical media studies or, or Marxian perspectives, if you will, is the term platforms. Yet even this term already uh, existed, but it was labeled differently as a multi-sided market and it al already existed with traditional media uh, so for example you have uh, media audiences on the one hand and you have advertisers on the other hand you have um, market research agencies such as uh, you know Ipsos, Nielsen, Pricewaterhouse that used to analyze audiences and provided data to interested advertisers. Um, of course, the media funded their own production uh, within this multi-sided market model. With the plat platforms, you basically have a vertical integration of these services. So you have a search engine, which is at the same time an agency in the rating system. So data allows them to perform these analyses in-house, which also allows them to, to provide advertising services at, at, at lower prices when compared to, um, to traditional media. Um, when it comes to, to platforms, there are some, uh, of course, um, uh, highly used approaches, such as the one by Nick Cernicek, uh, and it's closely related to our approach when it comes to understanding the role of data in this process, and, and Cernitec applies it to a number of, uh, of business models, such as advertising platforms, cloud platforms, industrial platforms, and so on. Yet he focuses only on data commodification, and when, uh, when he talks about, uh, or data as a resource, when he talks about monopolies, he usually uses terms such as um, network effects or uh, outcomes of digital technologies, and he basically does not go into too much details. detail when it comes to legal forms that are necessary for the establishment of monopolies and the, their entrenched position, uh, nor does he explain the history of networking technologies and what went into them. Um, so I won't uh, linger too long on, on these approaches. We, we talk about them to some extent in, in the book, but we also try to position ourselves in a, in, a, in a way that we analyze uh, legal forms and, and to historical developments to some extent of, of some of the central technologies that digital monopolies uh, are built on. Um, there are, of course, different perspectives on monopoly as well. Um, uh, monopoly capitalism perspective comes to mind. Uh, but in the book, what we try to uh, explain, and, and this helps us also to, uh, to analyze recent regulatory uh, initiatives in the US and the European Union when it comes to uh, fines that were imposed to, to, uh, to big tech companies. Uh, and these are basically uh, based on an idealization of uh, perfect competition, uh, which is enshrined in, in most uh, liberal democracies as one of the key normative benchmarks. So uh, we argue in the book that perfect competition is equally difficult to find as are perfect monopolies. So very rarely there's a single seller of a commodity in the market. Even Google, which is almost a near monopoly with more than 90% market share on global search engines, is not a perfect monopoly. 
equally hard uh, is to find a situation of perfect of perfect competition. So we understand uh, monopolies in line with Christopher's um, uh, Marxian legal scholar. Uh, who basically says that uh, monopolies and competition are not end states or fixed states. These are rather uh, end points on a continuum. Uh, and I think this is important to, to remember when it comes to monopolies. So, um, let me just move to the next slide. So briefly, uh, what when we talk about monopolies, we uh, outline uh, three key points. Uh, the first one is, as I said, said, understanding that monopoly is not a stage in capitalist development, and this is advanced by the monopoly capitalism perspective that you that I uh, showed you. Um, uh, in the previous slide. So monopoly is actually a dynamic process in our understanding, enabled or constrained by a specific regulatory regime. Uh, and we will get to, to some of the key elements of this type of regulation um, in a minute. One of the key aspects is the, the fact that these services such as Google and Facebook are offered at zero prices. So the neoclassical economic perspective on antitrust states that uh, or starts with the assumption that consumers want the lowest possible prices so if consumers get some products at the lowest prices and obviously getting something for free is is uh, as as low as as it gets uh, unless the, the provider pays money for you which is never the case so since google and facebook are offered at uh, uh, no cost uh, according to this legal interpretation, a very conservative legal interpretation, this means that consumers get the best possible product. Now, the problem with that is that there are no alternative products to choose from, so you cannot really estimate if this is really the, the main product, the best product or not. The, the only benchmark in this regard is the price of the product. So the second point is understanding uh, that monopoly is a process of concentration of capital, which was visible in mergers and acquisitions across the history of capitalism. So it's not just a current state. Um, and also understanding that monopoly is not related to economic processes, uh, which is uh, kind of a, so to speak, an intellectual trap that many um, Marxian, but also uh, mainstream economists, especially mainstream economists, get entangled uh, with. So monopoly is basically um, also related to how private property is shaped by the politics of the state in the form of intellectual monopoly. Uh, and we will talk about patents uh, in, in the second part of, of the presentation. So taking all this into account, uh, the, the question is really how to build a political project or, or how to build um, a regulatory approach or a reform uh, a approach of the current state of the art uh, simply by looking at, at legal forms. And we argue uh, again in the book that um, these legal forms that basically brought about the current stage of uh, digital oligopoly are now being used to curb that monopoly so they don't escape the logic of, of regulation or, or the logic that that brought them into power um, we talk in the book about different modes of production and, and tony will talk more about that in, in his part of the, of the presentation and we also look at um and and that's why we took the title of uh from public innovation to monopoly and back again uh, simply because many, um, many digital technologies were built through public innovation or public investment in, in a variety of, of services, uh, going all the way back to, uh, to early 20th century, especially if you talk about uh, Silicon Valley. So it's not just commercial interests and market interests that uh, brought innovation. It was essentially public innovation and public investment in the development of different technologies, rating, ranging from, of course, the internet to uh, different time-sharing principles, to uh, human-computer interaction systems, uh, to vacuum tubes in, in the early uh, 1910s and 1920s. And of course, the role of the universities and, and the governments was essential uh, essential in, in this context. Um, 
so there are a number of different technologies that were built on 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 um, on publicly funded publicly funded innovation, and this is something that that often gets forgotten when we talk about uh, uh, big monopolies and we talk about when we talk about technological innovation in general. So here's an example of um, of technologies that uh, the first generation of iPods, as well as iPod Touch and iPhone and iPad, were built on. So you see that a number of technologies that they basically inter integrated, ranging from click wheel, cache, lithium ion batteries, signal compression, liquid crystal display, micro hard drives, microprocessors, were basically used uh, and assembled in a way that uh, allowed uh, success successful commercialization and, and commodification of, of public innovation. And of course, Apple is is often in a, at least in, a, in the official managerial or promotional discourse presented as as one of the most innovative companies um, in the United States when it when it comes to big tech. Um, so now we come to the to the notion of uh, legal forms, and and there were a number of them which allowed uh, commercialization of of these uh, publicly funded technologies. The first act was uh, from 1980 and this act allowed publicly funded knowledge to be patented the bay dole act uh, from 1980 in the united states and this act was one of the reasons for um, a large number of spin-offs from uh, pharmaceutical industry spin-offs uh, from um, the u.s universities uh, a number of uh, legal forms also appeared as commercialization of the internet started uh, or the World Wide Web and the internet started in the 1990s with the information superhighway discourse. Um, of course, another set of legal forms was the agreement on trade related aspects of intellectual property rights, which set international standards in the World Trade Organizations, Organization and also entrenched a number, uh, entrenched um, developmental inequalities between the most developed countries, which, which hold a number of patents on um, various industrial applications and, and other countries that have to pay royalties for the use of these, these patents in their services. And, and the final one, and perhaps the most important one from the perspective of um, antitrust um, uh, and competition, um, uh, regulation is is what I mentioned before, which is the so-called consumer welfare doctrine in antitrust interpretations, which um, basically explains consumer welfare from the perspective of, of prices. And since you don't pay for these services, uh, consumers are, um, in theory, uh, satisfied. There are a number of legal scholars that started to question this uh, this perspective, uh, among them Lena Khan and Timothy Wu and, and a number of other scholars uh, that, that also um, uh, received, um, received some high uh, political or, or regulatory positions in the current Biden administration. So it is changing, but we argue in the book that this antitrust um, change or shift from consumer welfare to, to competition will not alleviate uh, the inherent problems of, of data commodification through, through platforms, uh, simply because it uses perfect competition as the normative benchmark, and it doesn't uh, impose alternatives to the existing uh, business model. Um, so I'll, now I'll give the word to Tony, who will talk more about free and open source software. Um, we we counter, uh, we, we pose together the questions of, of copyright and, and copyleft as two different ways to legally shape uh, the product that is the software. Uh, the question to me comes from uh, working as a software engineer, where I became aware that there is this duality, I can release my code as a, as a free software, or I can, or I can uh, have it packaged uh, as, a, as a product, as a commodity by the company I was working for. And, have it sold for for profit, both with necessary in a sense. Profitable business was of course necessary to pay my wages and uh, it's a dominant form of uh, wealth production. But also the free software licensing, the copyleft, copyleft was necessary to have a community of engineers that were creating wealth in parallel and that were historically the driving force 
uh, in, in many ways in innovation, in networking and, and software. Uh, I wouldn't call it a dominant force, but definitely a important force, uh, maybe even dominant in the early days of the internet and in the early days of, of computing, we're talking about 70s or perhaps even 80s uh, as back at that. So what we realize is that free and open source uh, flows here, the, the short the use for it is an input to to large uh, monopoly uh, uh, digital platforms. Uh, it's a necessary input. They can't uh, uh, function without it. Uh, it's uh, well known, well documented how Google's uh, uh, Google's network farms and, and, and Amazon, for example, as well, that we don't deal with in the book, we deal more with Facebook and Google. They were built on, on free software. And uh, it is specific fine grain detail in licensing that allowed, for example, Amazon to close down the changes. So the, the uh, more restrictive free software licenses, uh, their legal form would force a contributor to release back to the public uh, uh, modifications to software, but only under the condition that that, that software was already distributed. So Amazon uh, found what they thought was a hole in, in that legal form and they said, well, we are never releasing this, the, the modifications to the software uh, in any shape or form. This was back in the days of the CD-ROM. We are simply using it on our servers, so we don't have the legal obligation to release it back. So they closed it back into a form of capital for them, into a form of means of production, which is uh, part of a profit-based company uh, a chain of production uh, without respecting the, the license that required it to be publicly released, the free software license. So we figured out these are different modes of production. Perhaps those who are more familiar with Marxian uh, uh, framework, mode of production may be a too loaded term for this, but it's a social form of production, no matter how we put it. Uh, a free software is not produced for profit. It's often within universities, uh, NGOs, and uh, publicly funded uh, uh, institutions such as military and civic uh, government and, and so on. Uh, so it coexists with uh, commodity production, uh, but it has been pulled into, we deal with that in the book, uh, there has been a lot of research to show how this uh, uh, in 90s uh, theorized uh, very in very utopian terms production has been drawn into dominant production, which is commodity production based on profits and, and surplus value. And uh, can we go to the next slide, please, Pashko? So this is the crux of our theoretical contribution, and it's the reading of uh, social form and value form, form theorists. Uh, last 30 years or so, I, I would say, uh, often today they are, they are called new readings of Marx. These are specifically social form and value form readings. and. Uh, Patrick Murray is perfect, perhaps the author who uh, most systematically uh, uh, he, he drew out uh, differences between general and, and, and determinate abstractions in Marx's work. He doesn't apply it like we do to contemporary phenomena, but he, he makes a clear uh, he makes it clearly visible uh, in more Marx's work and applying it himself in, in his own work later that. Uh, there is such a thing as a set of general abstractions, which is top of this schema. So when various factors or elements uh, of production are called in, uh, drawn into a production process, they produce outputs and they're distributed and consumed. And this process, we call it production. And, and for someone who wants a more mainstream approach to this or parallel to this uh, OECD, uh, standards of national accounting or their manuals or handbooks are, are good ways, uh, good places to have a look and see how production is de defined in very, very general terms. So through general abstractions, they talk about goods and services, but you will rarely find uh, such a thing as commodity or capital. Or uh, when we do find it, it's not discussed as a specific way of producing, which is, of course, what Marx called capitalist mode of production and which is what dominates today. Commodity productions on the bottom of, of the screen, when uh, money is, is used to become capital and produces commodities and via exchange, we, we buy goods and services and uh, uh, capitalism ends up with surplus value with, uh, uh, in accounting terms with profits in a form of uh, rent interest or, or simply a business profit. 
what Marx did for the first time was to differentiate these abstractions from general abstractions, saying not every production is the same. So he would say that, you know, production of a craftsman back in the feudal times or even during the capitalist time that he described, uh, artisans and craftsmen, they, they were not capitalists, but they were also under the influence of, of uh, formation of valorization or how the prices were formed, because once you produce your goods in your workshop, uh, you're not a capitalist, you work for yourself, you don't exploit anyone, but then the price of your product is uh, formed on markets. Once it goes to market, uh, the capitalist law of value or tendency uh, forces its price onto, onto the product. So there are these different ways of discussing, uh, discussing uh, ways of social forms of, of production, as we call it. Uh, can we go to, to the next slide, Pash, please? And then this is the place where we tried to uh, put our stamp onto these products, which are not commodities, which in mainstream are not discussed in any meaningful way, at least not in the literature that we reviewed. And we took quite a broad swipe. Uh, we call basically uh, free of charge services and products which are used to derive revenue and profit in a capitalist production, we call them pre-commodities. That's in the middle of the bottom of the screen. So Google search or Facebook is a pre-commodity for us. It took a while to come to this name. We, we had various terms and then we realized it's a it's something that it's a product that leads to commodity. So already in itself, it has the logic of surplus value, the logic of profits, and and the overall logic of of an, you know capitalist production as as we know it. Uh, however, what's different here is that product is not sold. You know, when we buy a car, we pay for it, then we drive it away, and it's ours. We we you know we use what we pay for here. Surplus is derived from final commodities. That is on the top of of the screen. That is from products that are advertised on digital platforms. And these uh, digital platforms, they do not sell. I mean, Google and Facebook are free for us users, but what they do sell is adverts. And these adverts, they lead to final commodities. That's why we call them intermediate commodities. So we introduced two types of social forms. Basically, we've intervened into Marxian uh, taxonomy, if you want, of, of categories and created new subcategories for commodities. Uh, because it's not enough just to describe them with a single word commodities. It's very confusing because in the old days when Marx was uh, uh, writing, we didn't have this, these different types. And it was enough to say that a commodity will produce uh, a surplus. So today what we have is that uh, uh, intermediate commodity, by the way, the name maps very well also on national accounting to national accounting because in national accounting, advertising is not added value it's it's a deduction from uh, uh, a total value that total value is of course the uh, value of, of this sole commodity and once you sell a commodity you have to calculate in your costs and, and advertising is your basically expense your cost so that that's the way how we've realized that facebook and google are simply uh, an enormous uh, advertising platforms that's their that the core business is of course advertising but that's well known what hasn't been discussed is is uh, a fine-grained uh, uh, differentiation between different social forms between pre-commodities and intermediate commodities that's that's what we add and then the last term on that i will draw uh, your attention to is public wealth. So both final commodities, but especially production such as Google and Facebook, so technologically driven production on the web, on the internet, uses a lot of public wealth as their input in production. And we didn't theorize that wealth a lot in the book. We just opened it up to discussion and it's it's in our final chapter, but it's basically outputs of publicly, fin publicly financed research, uh, which can be then either used by anyone uh, so it, it remains as a sort of public wealth. Uh, so it can be used by either Google for their server, or I can install it on my laptop and run run a version of Linux or, or BSD or whatever software I want, which is under a free software license. Or it can be uh, uh, closed down, like Pashko showed a few slides earlier. Uh, it can be research, for example, at Stanford University, where it's public research that funds research in algorithms for search, but then uh, founders of Google uh, are being granted a license to use that as a as, as foundation for the business, and eventually Stanford sells uh, sells their shares in in Google, and uh, it becomes a commodity. So we have it here a chain of 
publicly funded, publicly wealth being commodified, first step being shared between public university, uh, uh, sorry, between university and a private company, and then finally becoming a fully commodified in this in this way, which we described here. So we can go further now with the with the presentation. To kind of uh, bypass some of the unproductive discussions, in our view, uh, between what the commodity is when it comes to production on these platforms. And, and I think with these uh, chains of commodities or with these three interconnected commodities, um, we bypass some of the entrenched positions uh, uh, that, that some of you might be aware between, you know, information commodity, audience commodity, and what is the source uh, uh, of value on these platforms? Um, but in th in this part, I want to give you just some uh, some numbers on on um, and perspectives uh, on 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 their at least economic and to an extent uh, of their uh, political power uh, of these companies. Um, when it comes to Google, Google, as I mentioned before, has more than 90% market share on, um, uh, on, on search globally. The, the problem with these numbers, and, and again, we come back to legal forms, the problem with these numbers is how much is enough and, and what is the benchmark uh, for antitrust to kick in? Well, the answer is actually pretty surprising because um, having a 90% market share does not necessarily pose a problem from a regulatory perspective. The, the reason why some of the fines were issued recently to, to, um, to uh, Google or Alphabet and, and also to Facebook in the United States, but not for antitrust, for other reasons, the reason why uh, some of the fines were issued were not uh, because of their 90% market share in, in the EU, uh, but because they abuse their monopoly power, that's that's one of the reasons, uh, or one of the uh, one of the um, interpretations of antitrust that is most of the time uh, used when it comes to uh, monopoly platforms. Uh, when it comes to Facebook, Facebook has 60% market share on on social networking. Uh, of course, Apple and Google uh, control almost the entire um, the entire uh, mobile um, uh, operating system um, market share. Of course, with with Android holding uh, seventy percent uh, of the market share, Amazon holds uh, around fifty percent of the U.S. e-commerce market share. Microsoft is is one of the biggest. Uh, is one of the biggest um, companies uh, along with Amazon in, in cloud computing and so on. Uh, so you can find a lot of numbers that can uh, illustrate the, the economic strength. But like I said, the legal forms uh, are interpreted in very specific ways. Uh, and it usually takes a lot of time to build uh, antitrust cases uh, with the history of antitrust also showing some cases that took decades um, uh, or that lasted for decades and ended up being unresolved. Uh, what is interesting also is if you, if you compare their total revenue in 2019, which was almost $900 billion for these companies, if, if they were a national economy, they would be ranked on the 18th spot uh, among the countries ranked by GDP, just under Netherlands and above Saudi Arabia. Uh, of course, uh, as we mentioned, advertising is one of their um, uh, main mechanisms and advertising overtook in 2016 in the United States. Uh, in, the internet became the biggest uh, or the main source for advertising investments, overtooking, of course, daily newspapers and radio, and finally TV in 2016. And the bulk of this um, in, in 2017, uh, almost 50% of that uh, goes, to, goes to Google. Um, the situation is pretty much similar when it comes to uh, Google's share in total internet advertising in, in, in Europe. And these are our cal calculations uh, based on, on uh, industry reports and statistics on the numbers of, of users um, and the sizes of uh, internet advertising markets in, in the countries that, that you see here. So Google's 
share in total internet advertising in 2018 in Europe was between 40 and 62 percent. Um, and most of that, uh, most of that is is money that does not um, uh, that is not taxed uh, in any way because these companies uh, uh, channel their uh, revenues to uh, countries that have the lowest tax rates uh, in Europe uh, and and globally. Um, Facebook's share in total internet advertising is slightly smaller in 2018, but it was still between 12 and, and 28 percent. So these two companies, and this is data for uh, three years ago, these two companies command between 50 and 75 percent uh, of internet advertising markets in European countries. Um, of course, the share is higher uh, in countries with higher internet penetration rates and, and with bigger uh, or with larger internet advertising per capita, uh, but it's still pretty large in countries with small uh, internet penetration levels um, as well. Um, so uh, if they offer uh, services free of charge. The question is, how is it possible that their services are not used by other companies? And this is where uh, the explanation um, again uh, draws on on, on the so-called legal form, or what we define as as legal forms in in our uh, presentation. Of course, you have a number of intellectual property rights. Um, that, that protect their uh, services and, and GAFAM are consistently ranked among top companies when it comes to the number of patents that they are granted each year. Of course, patents that do not mean that they end up being commodities that, that bring profit to, to their owners, but what they do is they stifle competition and, and make it difficult for um, up and coming companies to compete. Uh, to compete with them, um, the the legally defined uh, the legally defined period for the expiration of patents is 20 years. And what these companies often do, and Google did this in um, 2017 or 18, I think, when its PageRank algorithm expired, they simply repatented the the algorithm under a slightly different name. Um, so if you want to use the algorithm, of course, you have to, to pay a, a certain royalty or if you, if you want to use it in a commercial, for commercial or industrial purposes, you have to pay, uh, pay a, royalty, a royalty to Google. Um, so of course, the question is, if, if you look at these numbers, if you look at the number of patents, if you look at uh, the accumulated capital, if you look at market shares, the question is, why is there no immediate action? Um, two explanations uh, that I think we can, we can touch upon in this presentation and perhaps discuss um, afterwards. Uh, are, are important. The first one is is uh, something that I that I mentioned um, many times already, and this is the antitrust perspective of so-called consumer welfare and zero price considerations. Um, so uh, although this is changing, as I mentioned, also in the United States and the European Union, um, it 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 uh, it takes quite a lot of time uh, also to bring antitrust cases uh, cases to their uh, closure. Uh, probably one of the biggest recent cases, or relatively recent cases, was the uh, antitrust case against Microsoft uh, in the browser wars. Um, and this ended up uh, being settled uh, outside of, uh, of court for a small uh, technical detail because one of the judges basically talked to the media before, uh, before, the, uh, before the final, uh, final, final judgment was, was made. And, and this was, of course, uh, used by uh, an army of Microsoft's legal scholars to, to, um, to finally uh, dodge um, divestitures and, and, and um, harder antitrust um, harder antitrust regulation. The second one is that, uh, of course, given their economic power, uh, it also transfers, transfers uh, naturally and, and fairly easily into lobbying. Um, and I will give you some numbers um, on, on their collective spending. Um, GAFAM, so these five companies, have collectively spent $582 million lobbying the United States Congress between 2005 and 2018. 
The most frequently occurring words, and of course, these are reported lobbying efforts. The most frequently occurring words across all submitted lobbying reports were privacy, tax, online data, and security. Uh, privacy was the number one issue for Facebook and Google. For Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft, tax was the number one issue. Um, in 2019 alone, Google spent 8 million euros lobbying in Brussels. And together with other uh, companies, big tech uh, collective lobbying uh, budgets in the European uh, Union increased by more than 510% since 2014. Um, one of the ways in which uh, there is a potential, of course, uh, to, to curb some of their power or at least to, um, to um, to, to make them contribute more to public finances because a lot of these companies uh, or, or most of them don't or in, in most countries they don't have any physical presence which means that they don't pay any taxes on conducting business in, in uh, European Union countries. Um, there were some initiatives at the EU level uh, in terms of uh, digital taxation, uh, but they failed to reach consensus uh, at the EU level. And currently there are ongoing discussions at the OECD, OECD level um, on uh, the unique digital service tax. So what we have now is, is a fragmented digital single market. Um, and, and this is really um, interesting to see because uh, competition and uh, single market is, um, is, is one of the key uh, key reasons for the establishment of the European Union and obviously there is no harmonization in, in this regard. So you have a couple of countries in, in, uh, in black uh, and as far as we know Turkey also introduced a, introduced a digital service tax. So I'd be interested to hear uh, your uh, your experiences and, 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 and what does that mean in, in, in Turkey and how is it collected. But and some countries have announced digital service taxes and a number of other countries haven't even considered uh, something like that and it's not a part of the public debate. And it's pretty much, uh, that is pretty much the case in, in our country. Um, so, Closing down the, the, the full circle, uh, of course, the question that, that, that can be asked is, is how can we, uh, how can we, what is the political stance uh, that we can take when it comes to uh, challenging the, the monopolies or challenging the accumulated economic, political and social power uh, of these companies? And I think what we need to uh, consider is, uh, is, is what we mentioned uh, in terms of public innovation and public investment. So not just in key technologies, not just in, in, um, in developing the internet, also in developing internet infrastructure, also in household investments, in, in, in computing equipment. Uh, these are all, um, in our opinion, uh, positions that can help us develop uh, a, a more uh, inclusive and more uh, and, and, and a more um, democratic, so to speak, um, internet in the future. Um, antitrust and privacy fines in the EU, as I said, uh, were substantial, but the biggest problem with uh, taxation as one way of, of, of challenging or, or at least one way of minimizing the, uh, the uh, economic and social effects of, of monopolies is that even if they are introduced, they do not challenge the main uh, business model, which is um, data commodification and surveillance. So uh, what we are talking about is basically um, imposing a, a, a small a, a tax, which uh, amounts to a small percentage of their revenue generated in different uh, nation countries. Um, also, the current debate of antitrust and uh, taxation is, um, is fairly limited because there's no discussion on how to redistribute these funds, uh, whether they should be uh, redistributed to commercial companies, which seems to be the case in Australia, um, uh, and in, 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 uh, in a case in which uh, basically the digital news industry is, is trying to uh, fight back against tech giants to reclaim some of the revenues that they lose because of their dominance in advertising markets. Yet, in our opinion, these uh, funds should be redistributed to different community media uh, or infrastructure development, um, or public innovation 
uh, projects uh, so that we can close the circle between public innovation, monopoly, and, and what we call uh, public wealth. Uh, in the book, we also discuss various possibilities of changing the, uh, the technological form or, or, or the design of, of uh, the technical design of some of these services, because um, essentially, if, uh, if these services can be constructed or produced, in a way that uh, allows an efficient connection between consumers or potential consumers and advertisers, they can also be uh, be constructed in a way that they uh, they contribute more to um, to a more uh, inclusive online environment, uh, whether in terms of you know curbing uh, disinformation or uh, preferably more in terms of uh, must carry rules for. Uh, different types of content that, that do not necessarily bring commercial gains, but that have certain effects on the democratic public sphere. So we discuss a lot of these alternatives in the book, and we wanted intentionally not to finish on a bleak or a pessimistic note, but we wanted to, to discuss and, and to close the circle again from public innovation back to, to some sort of public wealth in which profit motives uh, do not have uh, center stage, uh, so to speak, when it comes to, to uh, key technical or uh, key digital services. Um, so, Tony, I don't know if you want to, uh, this one is for you uh, to, to close it out. And then I can well, finish I'll, with I'll be very brief. I mean, this is, this is what we only touched on in the book. We didn't develop it uh, in, in any great detail. Uh, it, to, to an extent deliberately and and then again there was no space the book is not dedicated to public wealth but it's one aspect of it for sure so if we think of uh, public wealth as outputs which are not commodities uh, which are allocated according to some certain plan uh, which are product of both public government or uh, central government or even NGOs uh, they're funded mostly by taxation uh, to a large extent so they are dependent on, on success of commodity producing part of the economy, which is uh, they have to be validated by, by exports, if you want, and by internal demand for commodities. Uh, this is a different social form of production. Uh, and in OECD countries, the statistic at the, at the bottom is from the OECD uh, handbook that's regularly produced. Uh, per, uh, 20.6% uh, 20 of the GDP on average in OECD countries is what is being spent on production of health, education, sports, science, technology, and so on. Uh, the, the lowest number is in Mexico, 11.8%, and the 30% the height is in Sweden. What we want to emphasize is that, and open up in this book in, in our last chapter, is that uh, it is very ideologically driven and uh, we think scientifically wrong on, on wrong scientific foundations to call this uh, expenditure or to call it simply spending. It's very rarely that it's discussed as production, as, as a different social form of production that differs from commodities, even though obviously it has many, many different uh, uh, characteristics than the commodity production. And so hopefully this uh, application of social form and value form marks in theoretical approach and methodology if you want to uh, 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 facebook and google as strange peculiar and not so easily uh, uh, not so easily fitting uh, models of production in capitalist commodity production hopefully some of it uh, in the future can be applied to uh, public wealth and to as 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 a large ecosystem of, of public production, not just software, not just science, not just engineering, which is the angle that we looked at specifically in the book. Um, and just kind of a final slide to, to perhaps try to recap some of it, and it's probably a, a lot. Uh, we, we opened a lot of topics in the book, and I think it was, um, the, the book was, uh, challenging because in practice you know that these companies function but in theory there are uh, few uh, concepts or at least few concepts that are able uh, to provide uh, a single framework from from which to 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 view them um, 
and of course it's up to uh, up to uh, future readers of the book uh, to decide if we were successful or not but some of the takeaway points um, I guess um, for this presentation are that um, essential technologies behind the domination of, of uh, big tech were developed through public innovation uh, and also through free software inputs uh, and as Tony mentioned these are inputs that don't have uh, that don't have um, uh, a correct name in terms of how do you conceptualize this it's usually and especially in Croatia being a, a kind of a post uh, post uh, socialist country uh, there's a lot of discourse uh, which is very um, uh, very neoliberal in terms of that the public is only spending uh, what the market uh, what the market uh, is, is able to create so um, uh, I think when it comes to GAFAM obviously there's a similar story about you know brilliant uh, hacker entrepreneurs uh, that went from rags to riches and, and what we want to do with the book is is try to uh, remind people that uh, public innovation was essential in the early stages and and again that the, the circle needs to be closed down in a way uh, of course the the platform model and we mentioned that uh, many times is established to extract value from user and consumer data and, and beyond current antitrust and, and other legal forms that, that hold it in place, what we think uh, is, is needed, uh, not only in academia, but also in, 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 in perhaps in, in future uh, or long-term policies, is thinking beyond, uh, beyond the entrenched model based on, on data commodification and, and surveillance. So, and we think that public wealth is, is, is a good candidate for that. So. Uh, I'll stop here and uh, thank you for the attention and we uh, look forward to your questions and, and comments. Pashko, thank you so much. There is so many things to take in from the presentation. You know, I, I'm still stuck at a few slides back and trying to recollect all my thoughts to put some questions together. You know, thank you so much. As I said, like, you know, it really opened up, uh, you know, some doors in my mind. Uh, so while I'm trying to formulate my questions, let me briefly, uh, let me just turn to Yusuf, you know, to Yusuf Hoja. And Yusuf Hoja, well, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hope the sound is fine. Uh, please just let me know if there's a problem. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot. Uh, this was really uh, eye-opening and insightful and meritful. Uh, and I just wanted to simply start with uh, how I, when I simply surveyed, uh, simply looked into literature on digital monopolies, I've seen a quite bit of a dominance of more, I would say, liberal, antitrust, more regulatory, more distributed perspectives. And seeing that your perspective simply is, is taking a step back and pro problematizes not the end results of the process of commodification, but the commodi commodification itself, that was actually really uh, something that uh, made me just look forward to just reading the, the whole book and the books also uh, in the process. Because I also myself working on ethics of commodification in the case of big data, I am quite skeptical to this uh, perspectives that happen to deal with the end results of the processes in the form of arguing for redistribution uh, on the basis of what comes out of the commodification process. So I personally always problematize the commodification process itself. And it was actually really nice to see, you know, a much more of a detailed argument uh, when it comes to digital monopolies. Uh, but uh, regardless, I still wanted to ask uh, some kind of a question on behalf of the other camp in this debate. Uh, people who don't necessarily even problematize digital monopolies, uh, rather even arguing that uh, they don't really create the problems that uh, usually with monopolies create in capitalist economies. And I just wanted to simply ask this uh, question as a just as a form of being devil's advocate. And this is going to be my first question. I would say that I have three sets of questions. One is that is a more of a critical question. 
Uh, not that I actually agree with that potential critic. Uh, I simply, I can say I disagree with that, but I still wanted to ask that. My second set of questions are going to be about certain implications uh, of your study and uh, certain comments that I would really be happy to hear uh, that you can make about certain concepts that I would like to mention. I'm just not getting, I'm not going to get into details yet. And my last question is going to be, uh, or last set of questions about are going to be about um, academia in general, uh, how, uh, so, so to say, more Marxian, more non-dominant perspectives, how well they are received and how challenging it is for academics to simply pursue, pursue uh, this uh, such projects. Um, and that, that's going to be my final question. So starting with the potential critic that you probably heard a lot about, uh, so when, when we talk about digital monopolies, uh, we of course talk about or problematize the issue of being a monopoly in a uh, allegedly free and competitive market. Uh, and why we usually uh, are afraid or problematize monopolies is that they, I, I believe, as far as I can uh, read and understand, that the first they charge whatever the price they want because there's no alternative. And the second is that in relation to that, they are being impediments to innovation. So that's why we're afraid of monopolies. They're not going to lead to uh, innovation. They're gonna, not going to really efficiently create public wealth, uh, wealth in general. And so that, that, that is simply why many uh, people problematize them. But there, there might be one argument that digital monopolies, in the case of digital, digital monopolies, that doesn't really happen. So even though that we can still perceive them as monopolies, they are still competing for new markets and new ideas. And most importantly, they simply don't really charge their users any fee. Uh, and there, there are also certain checks and balances uh, probably created by the advertisement agencies. There are also potentially new uh, different platforms that they can invest in an advertisement uh, businesses. And so all these checks and balances all this potential, even uh, potentiality of the, even the resistance within the platforms, that uh, that they're always threatened by the simply potential theories that might happen within the platforms. I mean, for instance, Facebook wouldn't ever want to piss off its users. So there are all these maybe potential reasons that maybe, yes, there are monopolies, but the reason why we're afraid of monopolies is that being impediments to public innovation and public welfare, but they're not really leading to these results. So why to really worry? So that, that's my first question. I think uh, it, it, it really comes close to, uh, it really comes close to, um, uh, Robert Bork, who is uh, one of the one of the kind of chief um, mainstream or conservative uh, interpreters of antitrust in in the United States, one of his final papers was actually a paper uh, written in 2012, I think, or 13. Uh, it was actually a paper about Google, and he argued that Google shouldn't be pub punished uh, for its innovation and for its success. Um, uh, one of the one of the pressures um, one of the pressures that 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 make them keep competing, if you will, although competition is is uh, is eaten up through uh, mergers and acquisitions, but also one of the one of the mechanisms that 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 kind of drives uh, their um, capital accumulation strategies is also financialization. And we didn't have enough time to talk about it um, about it here. Uh, Google is, even though the founders uh, have still the majority of voting power within the company, Google is 60-something um, percent owned by uh, institutional investors. One of the interesting things when you look at their um, uh, market capitalization is that even during the corona crisis, when uh, advertising investments were falling, uh, and obviously advertising being their uh, main mechanism for uh, generating revenue they were still recording uh, uh, recording uh, record-breaking market capitalization numbers um, so uh, I think you need to look at it not just and this is because obviously because of the pressure from investors who are afraid that you know that the company will suddenly start dropping in their revenues and then 
Google buys its own shares and beefs up the price. So there's an entire, again, it, it, it's based on a number of legal contracts uh, with shareholders. But my, my point is that um, it's not just an economic process. And that's something that we were trying to talk about in the book. Um, it's based on uh, on a number of uh, legal forms. It's also based on on, on, um, on on inequalities in distribution, which which also depend on, on financialization. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question uh, correctly. Uh, I think even uh, some of the uh, mainstream uh, uh, economist scholars have started arguing that you know uh, prices are not the best uh, estimates of of consumer welfare. You have a number of negative externalities, right? You have disinformation. You have hate speech. You have uh, lowering journalistic standards. These, all of these, can be attributed to to the business model. So I think the the, the problem is that um, uh, the legal norms were uh, created based on on mainstream economics. So it's difficult to use the same norms that created the monopolies to curb them. So essentially, we need different legal norms to tackle these social issues. And I think. The European Union is perhaps coming closest, but I'm not putting my uh, best hopes uh, either in, in many of these initiatives. If you look at GDPR, for example, it's used as a it's it's often hailed as a standard for data protection, but GDPR is in no way connected to antitrust. And and of course, I mean the main problem with this is data commodification or data surveillance business model. Uh, and it's the European Union is kind of tackling different small fragments, but it doesn't see the big picture. So I don't know if I answered your, your question. I just kind of I'm spinning off with with different ideas that we didn't mention. Okay. Perhaps Tony has a more clear um, vision of, of a response. No, look, as a as a as a theorist, I and as a citizen, I want these services to become public utilities. A lot of people wrote about this. We didn't mention it much in the book simply because there was a limit of space and scope of the book. But I think that uh, social networking is very innovative as a product that connects people in various ways, but it has been captured by the logic of capital. And in a similar way, if you look at the railways, that's why I think for us, historical perspective is always important. Uh, railways were initially private enterprises uh, conquering the world, you know especially in the Middle East, you know, the, the, the German rush to, you know, who's going to own the, who's going to own the Middle East railway. That was a big, big battle between Germans. And I don't know who the other side was, but I know the Germans lost that as much as I remember. It was a railway down the I Iraq in Iran. And what I'm saying is at some point, these private enterprises, there is a realization by the government that Marx would call it the, the logic of, you know, the logic of capital as such on, on, a, on the level of society and, and various Marxists to develop this further. But forget Marx for a moment. Capitalism needs certain functions to operate on a level of society as such. One is transport. Uh, however, at some point, the individual, individual capitals could not have produced networks and they could not have produced uh, uh, railways. So we have here uh, government intervention and production of public wealth as sort of intervention in uh, standardization and uh, what's called network effect in mainstream. So I think there is a good, we are at a good stage where I would hope, I still didn't see much of it when the regulators would say, let's turn social networking and cloud storage for example and cpu time in cloud and let's a lot of these you know modern day utilities let's sort them in, in utilities and have public sector and state involved in that not necessarily run or own completely by them uh, but let's open up those areas for competition to come back directly to your question because i think you know a lot of google products are terrible the google drive is really a terrible product i tried to use it this morning i recorded a video and I had to share it with someone. It took me two hours and then I gave up and just shared it over Wi-Fi, you know? And anyway, Google, Google Gmail is not a, such a good product, uh, but Google search is the best search that I can find every year or two, you know, I'll go and search for different searches and read engineering approaches. And so there are a lot of questions here. One is, yes, I think that they are stopping competition. 
you cannot rewrite algorithm for your wall on Facebook. I wish I could. I wish I could have a piece of JavaScript or whatever API they give me, Python, any language. You know, as a former engineer, I still write bits of code. A lot of people write code out there. It's not so hard. Give me access to what sh what's shown on my screen. Of course, that doesn't work in Facebook favor because it has effect in revenue from, from advertising. So I, I would say that uh, uh, Two main questions here for me are, when are we going to ask, when are governments in our name going to ask for these types of innovative services to become utilities, one? And second, when they do ask this, do not close them down as state monopolies, but open them up to innovative university projects, NGOs, and small companies and allow capital to inject fresh ideas. Why not? And to have private companies but let's not dream about capitalism as such or capital on its own producing innovation all the time or competition because you know facebook wall is terrible so is google drive a lot of those products are not very good at all they have been innovative 10 years ago not anymore actually that's uh, that's like a google bubble uh, we we kind of uh, have this imagination there is no outside uh, there's no world outside google so whatever google simply offers us and then we simply continue to use and that that's exactly one of the problems of digital monopolies but then just moving to my second set of uh, set of questions and just taking it uh, from the externalities and social effects um, while i was just simply looking at the presentation there was this like one word maybe that used it into some kind of an equivalent to that, uh, that is very, very central to the Marxian economics and Marxian simply critique of uh, social critique, and that is the relations of production. So when it just for those of uh, you like watching who have no uh, simply knowledge of this issue is that, you know, depending on the mode of production, uh, diff different modes of production simply might lead to different social relations between uh, the, the people, in the case of capitalism, the people who own the means of production, people simply who do not own the means of production. And in the in the case of capitalism or the production, these are processes such as alienation and uh, exploitation. Uh, so can we simply say that these uh, potential relations of uh, production still persist in the case of digital monopolies and simply the commodification of data? Or should we maybe go beyond that and maybe offer not just uh, the term relations of production, but maybe even relations of data or data relations that might simply uh, offer its own processes or uh, own social processes that uh, are shaped and enacted between different parties in this uh, mode of production? I mean, that's a hard question <laughs> to answer. Yeah. Um, I mean, from my perspective, it's the methodology. We, we, we tried to show that this is a methodology, a set of analytical approaches, if you want, a theoretical approach. So the answer to your question is take what we developed and run with it and, you know, <laughs> give us the answer because it sounds like it's comes from your own perspective of your research. So uh, what's Im it's important is that for us, at least it's shown at the, uh, at the beginning of the research. Uh, when I came with some concepts and categories to Pashko, then we discussed it more in a practical terms through empirical and, and uh, examples. And it's shown that it's not so easy to capture with a name or a concept. It's not so easy to capture uh, those entities and social relations, like you say, that develop. Uh, but I'd say, we have to follow the money. I mean, something we don't talk about much in, in the book is the monetary theory of value. We just didn't have space to develop it, but it comes from those kind of Marxian readings where if money is the only form, the only appearance of, of value. We don't have any other, you know. Uh, money does correspond to labor hours. Yes, I, I agree with a lot of Marxian research which shows on aggregate there is a correspondence between labor hours and money, but you cannot have individual correspondence. It's impossible. We don't have statistics. Companies don't publish them. And anyway, it, it, there is there are certain levels of reduction, you know, complex labor to simple labor, education, you know. So there are a lot of uh, uh, reductions that happen between labor hours and, and money. So follow the money, and I think with the logic of social form, and then you will see the answer to your question for yourself because we didn't deal with it so much. But I think it has to be within the dominant mode of production 
or within public wealth production, such as universities, public health, public education, or government-funded research. That's a separate, different form of production, which has not been theorized. We tried to open it up in our, in our book a, a little bit. But it is very difficult you know, to, to I think, make big jumps. Uh, I, I think what, what, uh, what, what perhaps uh, remained a bit un unclear was um, the entire, and, and the, the first theoretical chapter is called uh, Theoretical Foundation, and what's, what's the name? The Science of Forms, I can't remember now. But, but the topic is about social forms. And, and what we mean by that is that uh, drawing on, on Marx's ideas of, 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 uh, of fetishism or what um, uh, Patrick Murray calls the illusion of the economic is that um, economic categories always have a social dimension. So you have different social forms that, 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 uh, that relate to, uh, to, to, to some economic categories such as money, capital, and so on. What we tried to develop also, and this perhaps comes relatively close to what you mentioned about data, of course, we didn't talk about data relations, but we tried to, through this uh, social form approach, we tried to um, try to analyze um, two concepts, basically, that were not a part of the standard Marxian uh, schematic, and, and one of them is technology because technology or technology was addressed, but mostly as means of production, not an important factor. The second one is user experience. Uh, and this again is not something that was that was theorized by Marx. So we tried to develop the concept of, of technological form, drawing, but drawing to, um, to a large extent on, on some of the works from, uh, from the Frankfurt School perspective. Um, simply because obviously if, if these are not economic processes if you don't have any monetary exchange when you engage with what uh, what we call a pre-commodity so if you don't pay for it there's no economic exchange there's no exchange of money but yet there is an exchange of data between the user in the experiment experiential everyday perspective um, uh, and obviously with, with the platform, and then this data enters the entire data commodification process. So that's probably the closest that we get to what you are alluding to um, in our book, uh, but we ground it in the social forum perspective, uh, which, is, which is based on a, on a specific reading of, uh, of some of the Marxian terms. Well, uh... Thanks a lot. And just my last question, that's going to be, uh, that, that's also in regard to what Tony just said, it, we are off, you're offering a methodology for other people to simply grasp, apply, and utilize. And uh, uh, even, the, even the concepts, you already mentioned, even the concept of public wealth, uh, just resonating with state monopolies, even the, uh, the sheer idea, sheer application of Marxian economics, that, that really, uh, is not so much well received in many circles. So this, this is not. This is a, just a general question about uh, the ways in which uh, that your perspective might be challenged or already being challenged, and how uh, in in the academic circles, what kind of simply recommendations or suggestions you would feel like making to people who are just putting forward such uh, systemic and holistic critiques. Well, I think we're we were pretty um, pretty precise. I think, and even uh, to an extent that it's possible when you talk about alternatives. Of course, in the majority of the book, we we talked about uh, about some issues that we see as contradictions of the the current and problems of, of the current model, but. We were pretty specific in terms of policy recommendations. I mean, we're not against taxation. Uh, we're not, you know, trying to to destroy the system. I think taxation is a great approach, and it's absolutely necessary, and we support it. The only thing is that this is a short-term measure, right? Um, so uh, the concept of public wealth is is a way. And, and by the way, this is not something that we kind of invented and, and conjured on on our own. Yes, to a certain extent, but you have. A number of scholars, um, even in, in uh, you know the the economic um, within the economy itself, such as Mariana Mazzucato, who has been arguing for these uh, these types of uh, approaches, and who's who's been very successful in in terms of uh, shaping a lot of uh, European Commission's policies. Um, 
even beyond Marxian economics, if you look at, you know, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, uh, I think he would sign uh, almost all of the ideas that we presented now. He, I think just last year, he, he talked about the need to curb uh, big tech monopolies. And of course, being the inventor of the World Wide Web, again, through public funding at CERN, I think he would be uh, very eager to sign, you know, the concept of, uh, you know, public innovation and public wealth. So I don't think these, it's a very, uh, I think, specific point in time uh, because the general public and the regulators are keeping their eyes open to some of the ideas that probably five or 10 years ago would, would appear, you know, as, as pipe dreams of, of, of uh, left politics or, or uh, Marxian analysts. And I think the, the reason behind the book is that we wanted to show that the Marxian framework can be very useful and serious scientifically in terms of analyzing uh, some of the processes, but also offering, uh, offering alternatives. And what we wanted to avoid in the book were kind of value orientations uh, of Marxism. We wanted to provide analyses of the current state, uh, of the contradictions that are embedded within the system, and also to, to provide some short-term, mid-term, and long-term alternatives. So I think, um, to your point, it's not just it's not just a, a kind of a left Marxian political economy perspective. I think it's uh, even if you read the work by some of some legal critical scholars in the United States, I think we we agree with them on a number of points, but we just try to push it a little bit further um, in our book, uh, especially uh, in discussing midterm and long term solutions. Uh, uh, I want to add to this that I don't think this was possible when I started my PhD a long time ago at the LSE in 2009. And, and, and I know it wasn't possible because that's what I was told in no uncertain terms after a year one of my PhD that like you can't you can't do this. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I just had a. Uh, so yeah, it was the, the times have changed a lot in ten years, fifteen years. I mean, it, it, what Pashko is saying, especially after the crisis of two thousand eight. I mean, for me, it was funny time in London, you know, studying at the LSE, which is. Uh, at the edges of the city of London, and then Lehman Brothers goes down. And uh, I, I played basketball with some of the people from, from the city who were losing jobs at the time, and I, I remember vividly the atmosphere. So along with that, you know, once the market for the properties collapsed, and once we had, you know, again, the crisis into 11 and 12 and now to 16, it's basically the, the Joe Biden program now that's in US and and Times have changed a lot, and I, I think that even though we use Marxian framework, I think that we are trying to give answers to a lot of the questions that quite a mainstream, I would say left liberal, but mainstream left liberal theorists are asking themselves as well. And if you look at the UCL, so, you know, not, not a very left progressive university per se in, in central London, you have a center for public value, you know, uh, led by Mariana Mazzucato, and then you have a universal public service is another project which is trying to argue that people in the U UK, the uh, poorest 10% of the population or so, should get free telecommunications, free food. So uh, the extension of the logic of public uh, production and public wealth and public health and education. So there's maybe our theoretical framework is a bit too much for a lot of the mainstream. But I think that we are driving towards a place that mainstream also needs to give its own answers. So whether we manage to influence with these kind of debates is questionable, probably not, but it's worth a try. Uh, well, thanks a lot. I have some maybe really particular specific questions, but I think it, it would be good to now leave the floor to others uh, and still uh, would be uh, if there, there is more time that I can simply mention them. But yeah, thanks for uh, the time being. Yes, Hojan, thank you so much for your questions. And Tony and Pashko, thank you for the answers. They've been enriching and uh, interesting. Um, now I'd like to open the floor up to questions from our audiences, uh, whoever is watching. So if you have any questions that you wish to ask, uh, ask Pashko and Tony, please do now. 
So let's see. It's it's always this moment of unease. You know, is there a question going to come? Is it not? You know, so it's. Mm, okay. It seems that it seems that there is no questions from the floor just yet. So, Yusufo Jam, is there anything you would like to add, or Pashko, Tony, uh, anything you would you, that comes to your mind as a final note or final comments before we slowly start wrapping it up? Well, I'm interested in in the digital service tax in Turkey. I don't know what the can, can you can you give us some in, some input on on that. I actually asked Arkan, our department head, who was just here, about this because I haven't heard much about it, to be honest with you. And I was actually surprised. I asked him, I was like, well, you know, you probably know this better than me what's happening. And he doesn't know, too. he told me that he didn't know also, that he wasn't too familiar with the situation. Um, what it might be is the following, if I'm not mistaken. Yusufoja, maybe you know a little bit also, or you've not heard really. about it. It's, uh, you know, with our current government, it's, it's, it's a little difficult sometimes to understand what they're trying to do. But as far as I understand, the tax was introduced as a way of supporting local technology platforms or local uh, communication services being built up. But I'm not, that's, that's the only thing that I could find out. I, I did a very fast Google search while, while you were doing the presentation to see. Uh, but as I say, unfortunately, our, our uh, government is quite opaque right now about what they do with these taxations. But as far as I know that they, they, uh, they're trying to do something. I have no idea, actually, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, but Thanks, Eva. Your government is not alone. I mean, I read what I could find on the web as well on, on Australian case. Pashko knows this better than I do. And it's, you know, one report says one thing, the other report says another. How are they going to distribute the deal that they signed with uh, Facebook and Google? It's unclear. They also say they will support small media and, and small platforms and not just the large players. Uh, but I think these are the early days. It's hard to tell. Um, they don't know what they're doing, but it's, it's an experiment. I think the that's the request. Sorry. Oh, the way that they've done it previously, I remember because there was for a while, if you, uh, you know, Yusuf might remember that there was a ban on YouTube access for a while in Turkey about 10 years ago. And although the reason that, that they'd given to the public was that there was apparently like, you know, a material or content on the platform that was like insulting the Turkish public. That was like the official re reason given. The behind the scenes explanation was that uh, the, the Google and whatever was not opening up um, an office in Turkey and they wanted to have somebody that they could speak to, to kind of regulate what's happening and, you know, apply pressure on the company, you know? So this is how traditionally, you know, the uh, current government in Turkey is kind of treated uh, the technology firms, you know? And it's also, you know, right now Turkey is the, uh, I think the leader or the number two in terms of asking content to be removed from social media platforms. So this is what they do, especially with Twitter. That you know, whenever there is a leak, you know, or a whistleblower, you know, account that's been set up to expose, you know, uh, corruption scandals, you know, in Turkey, they immediately pressure uh, the offices of the technology companies over here, and they usually comply. It's the same with Facebook, although now they are trying to take a little bit of a more uh, strong. They are trying to try take a stronger stance against, especially um basically government propaganda and you know stuff that's kind of spreading from you know the, the way the government's kind of trying to instrumentalize social media to uh how should i say manipulate the public sphere you know so the argument is quite you know it's it's different over here and i, I think that maybe yusuf Oja would maybe agree with me that uh, here the strange thing is that yes i mean Many people are not happy with the services provided by these technology giants. I mean, as, as Tony was saying, I mean, I'm not a fan of Google Drive, of Gmail, whatever, you know, but also at the same time, anything that would be set up by the Turkish state or funded or sponsored or whatever, I think people would be very uneasy, you know, and so... Uh, it really depends on the national context, you know. I'm not sure I would ever be convinced that <laughs> uh, to use something that's like built or, you know, made in Turkey in terms of technology. 
Yusuf Hoca, what do you say about this? Well, I do agree, and but I have heard some kind of a call for interoperability, a uh, mm -hmm. way to maybe subsidize the local uh, investors and the local uh, startups. That I heard, but the problem is that we just hear about them. Uh, the, especially in the case of digital technologies, I think the logic of uh, public policy here is run by the logic of unintelligibility, ambiguity, and inaccessibility. So most of the time we either can't understand or it is like intentionally ambiguous or we can't really have an access. Uh, this is a really uh, off-topic example, but you probably all remember this uh, migration or so-called refugee deal between the European Union and Turkey. And I was actually actively seeking that, that document that, you know, the very content of the argument, uh, agreement, uh, I made like request to the, uh, the, the, the uh, the, the presidency and at that time and before the ministries and there was there was no like feedback so there it, it's really hard to have an access uh but yeah there, there are so, certain calls it's just hearsay and we're just gonna see how that's gonna turn out i mean as to Evo, as to what you mentioned about the government, of, of course, the, the such uneasiness would be understandable for any country, not just for Turkey. But let me just remind ourselves, not just you, because I forget those things as well. There is a book, I think, written in 2009 or 10, University of Chicago Press, uh, which shows how the NSA and CIA in the United States have been invested in every single large company known to us in the US. And the deal was, we give you a few million, 10, 20 sometimes dollars, you give us access to data. And then another thing that I know from my earlier days as, as a software engineer in, in the UK is that it was a public uh, a, a secret, you know, so everyone knew it, but you couldn't publish it, that Microsoft gave public access, uh, backdoor access to US government to Microsoft servers, Microsoft desktops, and that certain governments like the British one, which was always traditionally close to the US one, had access to it as well. So, I mean, if anyone is has developed, you know, a close relationship between services that we use daily and, and you know, it's in government, it's the United States, you know, I mean, Absolutely. when they, so, so I agree with you. I mean, I'm uneasy, but I don't think that that's solved simply by, it's more solved by perhaps a technological social solution, combination of regulations and technological solutions of encryption and, and where the data resides and you know how it's stored. So some kind of, I would say public regulation where, where state takes a part and invests, in, invests itself in it, but does not necessarily provide everything. But I mean, uh, something that Pashko has, has done a lot more work than I did actually, I just consumed work of his and, and some of his colleagues is on the role of media, which we didn't touch because you know the, it's such a large area and how does Google search or Facebook wall influences our uh, perception of public sphere in politics, you know, and arguments in political, especially during the election time. And we know the, you know, the what happened in the U.S. with uh, accus accusations of uh, uh, Russian funding of, of, you know, campaign and, and all of that, and and the big scandal with the uh, abuse of Facebook data. But uh, I wouldn't be. Uh, uh, it's uh, the, the, the monopoly social networking seems to be, you know, a, a nice vehicle for government. It's it's a simply it's simple to control. They have to talk to Mark Zuckerberg again to Google board. It's talking to two boards basically for for access to filtering of news, for example, to citizens. You know, we don't go to use portals anymore, or we use one or two of them, and they're again driven by marketing from. Google. So it's it's a large set of complicated issues. But back to just one small thing about data question at the beginning is bug, bugging me. I think the same way like we cannot sell votes or like children cannot work or the human organs cannot be legally sold. M maybe certain aspects of data can also be put out of commodity form. So we, we put a legal social form on it, which says mm -hmm. this thing that we call data now cannot in for certain aspects be a commodity mm -hmm. the history is full of you know examples so why, why not apply to data as well and actually to to piggyback on what you said uh, this is what mariana mazzucato uh, mentioned when it comes to patents on vaccines she's mm -hmm. her 
and this is actually an article that, that Tony sent me a few days ago. Uh, and her argument is that um, any type of, uh, you know, private ownership or monopoly over uh, patents over uh, coronavirus vaccines should be lifted. Um, so, and again, this is not, not an argument made by, um, you know, by from a radical left perspective, the, these are arguments that have, you know, gathered a um, substantial, substantial number of supporters. Yeah. And yeah, now, now, do I, I, I'm sorry, I was just thinking about something. Yusuf, do you have anything to say? Uh, or... I know, I would only say I completely agree with the last point <laughs> when he made <laughs> in regard to simply the wrong of commodification when it comes to many different things that we simply problematize. But, but once we normalize it, I think that's the problem. But yeah. So one thing that I'm also a little bit interested in is, you know, how we're talking about commodification and uh, the idea of tracking technologies and, you know, how tracking technologies are extensively used by these companies and how tracking technologies also find their ways into news websites and uh, they end up influencing the way news is presented, actually. And, you know, just a very, I, I did a very brief study with a MA student of mine few years ago when we were looking at the uh, tracking technologies on news websites in Turkey, you see that like, you know, it's, it's just, you know, not only is there a huge amount of, you know, a variety of different, a portfolio almost of different technologies that work, catching, you know, various bits and pieces of what you do, it also fundamentally alters the way we consume news, you know, to the point where, you know, uh, increasingly just to get, you know, attract more traffic, to have more users and stuff, the way news is presented on these websites increasingly become more clickbait-like, the contents become more uh, visual, a lot less text, a lot less intellectual, you know, so we're seeing also the quality of information in the public sphere decrease drastically, and these are, you know, quite major newspapers in Turkey, so and we were, you know, interested in comparing it to their newsprint editions, and you see that there's a big difference, you know. And increasingly, as the newsprint editions are getting phased out, you know, and the digital editions are one the ones that are becoming, you know, the main, the flagship, so to speak, of these, you know, of these media actors. You know, um, my argument, and I never finished the paper, you know, it's something I want to do. But I was, you know, what I realized was that increasingly people are being impoverished in terms of, you know just the information that they get, you know? And this is already something that's, you know, in a country like Turkey where there's already low newspaper readership, that, you know, people don't have too much, you know, uh, knowledge about the world, you know? So this is also contributing to, to you know, the, um, uh, the decline in the public debate, so to speak, you know? So this was something that I found to be, uh, um, you know, a very real effect, so to speak, of these technologies and how they work in terms of news. and media yeah well they do create structural conditions uh and they 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 create it it would be uh, of course uh, problematic to argue uh, from a classical kind of frankfurt school perspective right that this is a full-blown dystopian control it's a very dynamic uh type of control and balance between these structural conditioning mechanisms you know and the range of experiential possibilities that that you through which you can engage with with different technologies but i mean it, it's it's they are used across the board uh the amazon uses different pricing mechanisms and art algorithms to kind of um, shake down uh, competition um there are other examples also of um for example through through tracking uh, technologies again on amazon uh, because Amazon is at the same time uh, a market provider and it's also a competitor within this market. So there were cases of, you know, people trying to sell or, or businesses trying to sell different products and services through Amazon. And then Amazon simply monitors, you know, how users engage with these products. And at the same time, it develops its own product and it starts advertising its own product on Amazon and then the competing products simply get listed down and they do not appear when people search for these products. So these are very kind of conscious uh, and very technical mechanisms for, for controlling markets. And it's, it's pretty much the same when it comes to, to different apps 
that, that are distributed, you know, through 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 Google Play or through Apple systems. Uh, basically, if you want to be listed on on either on on Apple system, you have to give away thirty percent of your revenue uh, to to Apple if you're an if you're an app developer. So at the start, uh, if you want to be listed, and Apple and 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 Google Play hold almost one hundred percent of the market for uh, mobile phone apps. If you want to get listed, you have to pass through these uh, through these um, gateways or, or through these toll booths. So there are, I mean, not just in news. Obviously, when it comes to to the media, it probably has the most visible and 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 dramatic effects when it comes to you know uh, disinformation and, and and stuff like that. But uh, it's it's also in other segments uh, that are built on on their uh, data collection practices. Absolutely. I mean, the one more point I forgot to add when I was making my comment was that also another thing that our study showed was that a lot of um, our media outlets that had completely diverging kind of you know ideological outlooks in the way they presented the news relied on the same uh, tracking technologies and the same kind of uh, app networks and whatever, and ad networks and whatever, you know. And this I found to be quite interesting because, you know, from the vantage point of media content, you have, you know, a spectrum of varieties, plurality, so to speak, of, you know, different voices. But when you look at it from the perspective of, you know, capital, you see that they, they, are, uh, they, they, they take their, you know, they, they use the same services to, you know, uh, create revenue, you know, and this was, uh, also shows how you know from a different perspective they are quite you know uh, tied together so to speak you know in a contradictory manner i mean speaking of apps we we briefly mentioned it in a book again for lack of space to go in more detail the app stores but uh it's in a part where we discuss christopher's and his idea of competition that there is a fierce competition at the bottom between the app makers and almost no competition at the top you have google store and apple store and you know, there's certain logic if you want to it. We cannot have you know zillions of stores, but uh, I think it it serves the logic of advertising-driven and platform-driven uh, uh, model. It's that's that's how it suits the regulators, and we'll see whether they will do anything about it. Uh, but uh, uh, there there's almost no recognition that monopoly is treated and competition are treated completely differently depending on the size of a player and depending on market. All right, guys, so it's almost 9 p.m. Um, I suggest that we slowly start wrapping it up as people are tired and uh, it's been a long day for all of us, I guess. Uh, Pashko, thank you so much for you know taking the opportunity, taking the time to be here. We really appreciate it as the big university media department uh, we wish we could host you here in istanbul i know that you like you like visiting same with uh, tony thank you so much for your time thank you so much for this wonderful presentation i learned so many things and i really look forward to reading your book i mean it's gonna be all my summer reads i guess you know so i'm quite excited about it uh yusuf Ojam, thank you so much for being a discussant again you know great insight great comments you know i really enjoyed the dialogue and made it very easy for me as a presenter you know i could just sit back and just listen to uh, the conversation that was happening all right so i guess this is the end of uh, our domino lecture today thank you so much for listening uh, people in the audience uh yusuf ojan pashko tony thank you so much everybody have a good night bye bye thank you thanks bye, bye.